Take care, everyone. Take care. Welcome to episode two of Yogananda podcast, autobiography of a yogi, line by line. Nice, uh, nice, so dude, done. <laughs> in- introduction nailed. Uh, we were <laughs> listeners of yours talking before that we we did we did so many uh, uh, introductions in the first season of Awake Minute by Minute. We're going to be in the habit of saying that now, so. We must concentrate on uh, not saying that. Uh, that's that's uh, the inside joke shared. Um, so yes, welcome to the episode. We've got a very interesting episode today, um, as uh, I'm sure all of them will be. Uh, so this this episode, well, actually, first I should mention in the last episode, you know, we talked about the title of the book. Uh, we covered uh, the, the topics of the editions, the cover itself, the back page, even the spine. Uh, of the book, uh, so missing no details. So the standard pose picture inside, we did talk about that as well as the signature in those bits, as well as much more. And that's where we're up to. So in this episode, we're going to be talking uh, about the preface, the de- um, well, actually not the dedication. We did say that we were going to talk about that, but that is not in the 2022 version uh, that we are uh, focusing on. So if you are using the dedication, that's why we're not talking about talking about it. As a reminder, we are in the 2022 version, uh, as well as the uh, spiritual legacy of Paramahansa Yogananda and the other acknowledgements, contents, um, uh, and other bits. So we'll jump into it then, uh, because there's plenty to cover, and hopefully we'll be able to cover it all uh, on this episode. Uh, so the spiritual legacy of Paramahansa Yogananda. Now, this is a body of text. I think it's um, what a page, page and a half long, um, that really was written by YSS SRF themselves, talking about you know a century later, uh, after the birth of Paramahansa Yogananda and the impact then that the teachings, the the writings, the lectures, um, the informal talks of uh, what they all had, and it's it's quite a nice um, introduction. And as you know, a layperson maybe reading this for the first time, being introduced, you know, we can talk to many people. Lauren is one of them who maybe just picked the book up with no background about Yogananda, mm-hmm. hadn't watched the Awake film. If maybe that's how some people got introduced to it. So this is a fresh read for for people. So it's a nice introduction. Um, they they cover quite a bit of detail in there. There's, I think, you could write a whole book on on the impact and the spiritual legacy of Paramahansa Yogananda. So they're not going to go into it to the nth degree. Um, so they cover topics of his uh, his complete writings, of course, as I mentioned, um, the the print, so that we, we talked about uh, that, that they want to keep it permanent uh, to Yogananda's um, work. Uh, the publications uh, of the SRF Council follow the guidelines of, of Master, so that's uh, really focusing on keeping the teachings uh, alive to the authentic way that Yogananda delivered them. And then the SRF emblem, they did mention that at the end, that it appears in all publications as a sign that the work originates by Paramahansa Yogananda. So you know it's authentic. Um, but as I mentioned, this, this body of work is substan- substantial. And I think we'll share a link to the readings that you can go out and get uh, for yourself um, on the, on this. Uh, I have a few uh, books, actually one of them is just behind me here for, for viewers on uh, YouTube. Um, I think together we have quite a few of the, the books, but there's poems, which are, are beautiful. Uh, there's you know Man, Man's Eternal Quest. There's the Divine Romance, um, lots and lots of books. Uh, the Body of Work on the Bhagavad Gita, it's, it's huge. So. You know, there is a vast amount of impact that all of these books will have that will never go, um, uh, never be measured, really, uh, in or maybe never, never say never, but uh, are, cannot be measured currently. Um, and the one thing that I did want to pull out here, but before I do, I see, Greg, uh, maybe you have a, a something to comment. Do you want to come in now with this? Yeah, I was just going to share, share the fact that the literary corpus, as Phil Goldberg described it, is colossal, isn't it? especially the mm. second coming of Christ and God talks with Arjuna. And that's aside from all his public talks, um, of which probably, what would you say, what, 10% were ever like, recorded and uh, there's three books of them <laughs> collated. Mm. 
from like man internal quest etc journey to self-realization etc mm -hmm. um so yeah it's quite a quite a um uh, exercise if you were going to actually read them all um just wanted to put it out there mike uh what percentage would you say you've read i reckon i've probably covered the majority of the Bhagavad Gita i've covered so that's a good percent maybe um and then the obviously the, the autobiography man's eternal quest lots of them um so i'd probably circle i'm on like 30 something percent what do you reckon mike do you think that's too ambitious what about you? Um, I must admit there's some books that I read a lot more often than others. <laughs> um, that doesn't increase the percentage. I just uh... I think thirty <laughs> percent is is pretty good actually. I I don't I I don't think I would have more than that. There is certain books that I have never really read cover to cover, like the wine of the mystics for example very beautiful book and i started reading it a few times but never made it through and then there's other books like this one here for example or only love and um also man's eternal quest that i'm i think by now i must have read many times each of them yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's something uh to that though isn't there i think that he has such a volume of uh, text available and he's and the SRF I think credit to them you know they've went about categorizing and putting it together and that's an immense amount of work as, as you say Prank. but maybe for the point in time that you are and the evolution that you're in something is really going to speak to you so you might want to read that over and over and over again I think he recommended to anybody who's maybe more negatively minded pick up the, the book on the positive uh positive, positive uh, sorry what's affirmations the name affirmations uh, the healing scientific healings and uh, affirmations sorry. that one talking about? that's Maybe. it and read it cover to cover and read it over and over again i think there's a beautiful story about one of the monks um on on that that uh it was used to a very powerful powerful extent um so yeah 30 percent is damp is good i'm not going to say what mine is i have no idea, no, no idea to be honest <laughs> lauren yeah i was gonna say i think I don't know where I heard this and I'm probably butchering it, but it's something along the lines of, you know, it's not necessarily about the breadth of your reading, but it's about the depth of your learning. So you may have only read two lines, but if you've really taken that in and you've really learned, then that's perhaps even more life changing. Um, but hey, if you can read 30 percent and learn from it all, that's amazing, too. So <laughs> it's, definitely, it's definitely not me. No, yeah. someone told me that, like, you have to get to 100 percent of all and then you get self-realized. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's exactly. all you have to do. So that's my. Um... Yeah, really <laughs> if only it was that easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a computer a speed, game. Speed, just read. Speed reader. <laughs> forget forget yeah. what you're reading. Put it good to practice. Just read it. Yeah. <laughs> AI, AI will be just it. Mike. <laughs> Yeah, it's so true what Lauren said about the breadth and the depth. And I feel like that applies differently to different books. There are some books that are a bit more easy to read and you get a bit more out of them each time you read them. And some of them, they're really like, you have to really mine your way through them. And I would say the uh, Bhagavad Gita is one of them. Um, and then even one level higher, or at least on the same level as all the lessons. Um, mm. And so there's there's quite a lot. So whatever you're in the mood mm -hmm. for, I, do you want to be entertained or do you actually <laughs> want to do research? There's everything is available. Everything's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we mentioned before, even, even the lessons, the recommendation is to read read it over a period of time. It's not to read it quickly and just you know get through it. It's to read it again and again and again, let it sink in. So yeah, we we uh, we have. A lot more reading and digesting to do. Um, so there, there's plenty to cover uh, there. But one thing that I did think was really quite interesting that they mentioned was the methods that he, Yogananda introduced, you know, many, many decades ago now, are finding expression in education, uh, psychology, business, medicine, uh, and other spheres of endeavor. And that's contributing in far reaching ways to, to the more integrated, humane, and spiritual vision of human life. That's a really interesting comment um, to, to make, to take the time and, and take up the space, I suppose, you know, on, on this page. 
and instantly I was thinking about conversations we've had where how many times have we said that will age or that aged really well or what you're going to said probably what, a dozen two dozen times or um we, we've talked about it uh with the neuroplasticity uh bit in a minute 56 actually if people want to go back and look at that look at that minute uh, or look at that episode episode 56 in the first season we talked about neuroplasticity and yogananda's let's say vision that is now coming to fruition that was uh, discussed in the awake uh film and that was amazing um talking about that so please do jump in and give that a listen but the other examples maybe we could think of some between us uh how to live schools Maybe is another one, and there is um, uh, something maybe Mike, you'd be kind enough to read out uh, on on the um, on the tab of the spiritual legacy of Parents of Yogananda. There is how to live schools. The context uh, of this is uh, Yogananda was saying that there is a lot of cost to not having education systems that would bring people up in certain ways that will uh, prevent them from going on to cause harm to society the billions that we we spend in uh you know in in crime in in loss loss of money there so there's a little bit here that i wanted to read on on this basis um mike can you yeah. <clears throat> the section is called how to live school uh, how to live schools are needed why not take the proper educational steps to avoid this annual theft of a billion dollars and use some of those millions for creating how to live schools where the art of living and a balanced development of all human faculties would be taught. I consider properly organized schools as gardens where infant souls are grown and nurtured. The gardeners should be well selected and given cooperation by parents and the public. We should never neglect teachers for they are soul molders. The care and spiritual nourishment of the early life of a human plant usually determines its later development. I sincerely praise the modern school system of America and its constantly improving methods of intellectual and to a certain extent, uh, physical training. But I cannot fail to point out its main shortcoming, a lack of spiritual background. If you, if you could just bring that conversation to today, it's really, truly needed now. Um, and we're probably living through a real revolution in, in education right now. And this is going to be more and more relevant as the years roll on. Um, Mike, what's your comments on that? Uh, it's, it's so true. I, I see the American uh, school system a little bit because I have a few friends who have kids in that, that age right now. And I was actually positively surprised how good it was and how flexible the teachers were. and. Um, I, the only thing I can compare it to is my own um, time at school in, in Austria. And I found everything there was a lot more rigid and um, you, you were more supposed to fit into a certain um, category. Whereas there it was a lot, it seems to be a lot more flexible and maybe that's a trend that is happening all over. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the main point he points out there is the spiritual, education and i don't think we have made much progress on that um mm. I, I guess this is difficult because right now as a world we don't really have a spiritual consensus and that makes it really difficult mm. to then teach it in school i guess mm. lauren yeah i think mike's absolutely on the money there because if you think about it like however old you are when you first start your conscious spiritual journey or development that's how many years you, years you have to undo so if you don't learn young how to live in this world you have years worth and i can say this from my own experience you have then years worth to unlearn and to relearn how to live um so i think it would be absolutely wonderful if we had that from birth upwards that would solve a lot of problems wouldn't it <laughs> yeah you get them when they're young um Mm. there's there's beautiful work going on with meditation i think mindfulness is something that we've you know we see everywhere mindfulness meditation you know well-being mm. and that's in in the psyche now isn't it um where you know 100 years ago was it in the conversation 
I think the the attitude towards it was kind of the complete opposite in some ways, a very materialistic drive in, in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, so, so it's really come to be, I think, um, the, the case that we're trying to get this into the education system. So it's just one one aspect that uh, really, uh, really has come, come true and it has aged very well. And there's a, a link that we can share uh, uh, on, on this topic uh, where uh, somebody has put together a lot of quotes on Yogananda on this topic and, and they're, they're awesome to read. So you can delve into those on your own time. So this, this section, um, Spiritual Legacy of Paramahansa Yogananda, is it missing anything, Priyank, do you think? Oh, you're on mute. I thought they did a good, I thought they did a good job of talking about, you know, the scientific uh, influence that Yogananda has had and, you know, in psychology and all those other things that you mentioned. But they could have gone to, they could have, they were quite humble in the influence that they've that he's had but <coughs> you know in in the awake film for example you know really highlights like for example all the yoga studios that are out there and all those all those all those um you know lectures that he did across the country and like bringing yoga and med meditation to the mainstream like that that the fact that you know universities you know doing research on meditation now and like proving various things about productivity and things like that is really really that was that seed um may have, been, may have been started by the Vivekananda but it was actually properly planted and nurtured by Yogananda not by his um you know just his his coming to US but actually staying and establishing ashrams and you know writing books and you know touring the country so i think they could have really they could have if 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 they uh were being less humble they could have really mm -hmm. drove home that message about how much how much the world really owes um in terms of the awareness and the, uh, the popularity and the 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 like the impact of yoga in everyone's lives mm -hmm. um like they they do it nowadays like they practice meditation like even children practice it right um, but they don't say, "Oh, it's a Hindu thing that Yogananda brought yeah. out." They they <laughs> just they just do it uh, as you know as a means as uh, rightly so as a means to you know bring better concentration etc to children. And, and Lauren, I'm sure, has done something like that with with some of the children <laughs> that she's worked with. <laughs> yeah, Mike. Uh, one one thing that stood out for me in the spiritual legacy was the the promise that they will always keep available the complete works of Paramahansa Yogananda, which is a fantastic promise, which means mm -hmm. like even in a hundred years, 200 years, that um, it doesn't really depend on how many people read it at the moment or how popular one book is or the other, but they will always make sure that all of this is available. I find that pretty great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been made quite clear that Yogananda certainly quite uh, evidently in, in the beginning <clears throat> chose the, the presidents of um, SRF and YSS. And when you listen to the presidents <clears throat> and the president today, you can really hear that devotion and dedication to Yogananda's teachings. It's always Yogananda, you know, told us this, gave us this information. Um, so it's a real sign of humility, I feel, uh, and an amazing choice, uh, I suppose, in individuals that uh, can bring you know shed the light uh, on yogananda's uh, teachings and not make it about them themselves or about uh, other aspects of yoga and we'll talk about the, uh, more about this in in uh, uh, in a later date uh, uh, as well as on this uh, podcast but let's um go to the author acknowledgments then and it's essentially the next the next page down and it's a short uh, paragraph maybe just to highlight, there's a few people in particular that are mentioned, Miss L.V. Pratt and Tara Mata, uh, Mr. C. Richard Wright, who many, many of the listeners I'm sure will know, uh, as well as Dr. W.Y. Evans Wentz. And we're going to talk about him in a lot more detail. So we'll actually just cover uh, Richard Wright and uh, Miss Pratt, Tara Mata. Um, maybe Lauren, would you kindly give us a little bit of info on who we're talking about here? 
Yes. Would you like me to read what it says? Please. Yes. So it reads, I am deeply indebted to Miss L.B. Pratt, Taramata, for her long editorial labours over the manuscript of this book. My thanks are due also to Mr. C. Richard Wright for permission to use extracts from his Indian travel diary. To Dr. W.Y. Evans Wentz, I am grateful not only for his preface, but also for suggestions and encouragement. And that was from Padmahansa Yogananda on October the 28th, 1945. Mm. Awesome. And now mm. I'd like for Ms. Ms. Pratt. Yes, um, there was a nice, uh, you found a nice bit about this uh, Laurie Pratt with Dara Mata. Um, Phil Goldberg writes uh, a lot about her as well, but um, there's a section that you've noted here. Um, in 1924, San Fran, uh, she was born uh, Laurie Pratt, uh, was a direct disciple for 45 years and served Guruji's work until her death in 1971. She took a final lifelong vow of renunciation um, from Yogananda and was given the name Dara, which is also my mom's name, uh, a name for God in the aspect of divine mother. And also Dara, Dara means a star. It's the literal, mm. the literal word we use in India for, for star. Um, and Yogananda signed her as member of the board of directors and editor in chief. Um, and she wrote two books. I don't know if you guys have ever, I don't think I've read these, um, Astrological World Cycles and A Forerunner of the New Race. I haven't read those. But um, mm. uh, Richard, um, sorry, uh, what's his name? Phil Goldberg, when he writes about this, he said that um, like she was not just like really skilled as an editor, but she tuned into him really well and just discerned the meaning behind his like torrent of words and ideas. Because you can imagine like Yogananda would have just said, here, write this down, note this down, note that down. And he would have not have like been very generous in terms of like, I'm going to repeat what I'm saying. He would have just expected mm -hmm. it because he would have been doing a million things. And he would have said like, get in tune with, you know, my thoughts and what I'm, you know, experience what I'm experiencing. And like, she obviously had that, that skill and she was, um, she must have been, what a, what a disciple and what a privilege that she must have had to um to, to to undertake this work and have guruji um you know acknowledging her contribution mm -hmm. and <clears throat> excuse me yogananda did say how important it was that he could reach more people by his pen uh than and, and his writings than uh, at the time uh he would be able to reach giving talks uh, and sermons and things like this so he really did know that this was a very important piece of his work uh, and this was a, a channel uh, that he he used essentially. So what a what a blessing as well to be to be able to be in that position. Amazing, correct? Yeah. Apparently, she also Phil Goldberg says that she also disagreed with Guruji over the editing issues. No. And um, so apparently, she felt so strongly about them um, that she was like not willing to budge. <laughs> uh, but you obviously Guruji perhaps wanted her to. Or bring out that quality of uh, you know resolute will, etc. Mm. Perhaps I don't know. I'm just guessing here. But um, when he like the, the when it was finally published, um, he like um, he inscribed in her copy of the book, her personal book, "May God and Gurus ever bless you for your valiant and loving part in bringing this book out." <clears throat> because she was when when they were trying to find the publisher, um, she was instrumental in that as well because. She went and uh, you went to New York, I think it was, and um, is it the Philosophic Philosophy mm -hmm. study, uh, Society? Is it that that published the book? And so she was trying to find publishers, and there weren't like queues of people because, you know, who wants to? No one, no one would have had the foresight to know what an impact this book mm -hmm. would have. Otherwise, every single every single publishing house would have probably bid for the privilege. But um, yeah, so she had to go. Apparently, she had to live in like really meager circumstances and like you know no no hot water like barely any uh, any stipend for expenses and so she she really did the dog work to try and find the publisher which she eventually did and um and that would have been without mm -hmm. any like you know any help or any help from srf because guruji would have been on the other side of the country at that time mm -hmm. yeah it's something that speaks to what yogananda said about organizations that he wasn't exactly too keen on, on running an organization or doing this work. 
um, but he did it masterfully. But he couldn't have done it with with other people like this. So it's it's awesome. It's really beautiful that he's firstly acknowledging this importance. Otherwise, how could we really be talking about it today? Mm -hmm. um, so they're chat. They're really strong channels, and he's uh, taking the time to identify uh, Taramata firstly, uh, which is really really beautiful. Uh, but there's also a very important individual uh, who is also part of a very important family uh, in the SRF. Um, Richard Wright, as some of our listeners may know, we did talk about this in minute 60 in some depth. But for everybody else, let's um, talk just briefly uh, on Richard Wright, who, who is. Mike, would you do the honors? <laughs> yes. Richard Wright was the elder brother of SRF YSS president Sridhar Mata. Their sister Ananda Mata entered the monastic path a short time after Diamataji and served on the board of directors of SRF YSS for more than half a century. Their mother, Shyama Mata, who also became a nun, was highly esteemed by Paramahansaji, whom she served faithfully for many years. The younger brother, the late Dale Wright, was another lifelong follower of the SRF teachings. For 10 years, Richard Wright was one of the guru's closest personal assistants. And of course, we'll see him in later chapters, traveling to India with Guruji and, and also Europe. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, what a blessed family, right? Yeah. Very, very important family uh, to the SRF lineage. Um, and a very nice dedication there from Yogananda, and this was on October 28th, 1945. So um, would have been around the time the first edition was uh, released when um, exactly, that, sorry. That, that year. That, that year. year, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, it was 1945. So um, yeah, very, very, very nice uh, to first and foremost acknowledge these individuals and it stayed in there as well. It hasn't been, I don't believe it's been changed since the beginning. Um, so yeah, uh, really, really nice uh, part there. As I mentioned, we're going to come back to Evans Wentz because there is a lot to talk about there uh, with this uh, individual and we're going to go into it in a little bit more detail. But next up is the contents. Now this is substantial because there's, you know, 49 um, chapters uh, in in the book and there's many, uh, many additional parts that the book covers. We did mention in a previous episode our favorite um, chapter, but for anybody who missed uh, who missed that intro, um, I thought we'd touch again on it because it's uh, there's so many amazing stories here, and when you read through the contents, you're just reminded of all these moments that Yogananda so carefully described. Um, and for me, there's a couple that stand out, and I I don't fully know why, but chapter twenty six. Uh, the science of creative yoga was one uh, for me that uh, was really beautiful, and the other one was the material materializing a palace in the Himalayas. That was just a special chapter um, in the book for me as well. Uh, it really had a deep, deep. Uh, it deeply touched me. Essentially, hearing about the uh, the manifestation of this palace and in in all its glory, and it really grasped my attention. I think at the time reading it as a, a proper newbie on the yoga yoga path. What about you guys? What's uh, what's your special or favorite chapters, Frank? I'm going to throw a curveball here. Um, mm -hmm. What is, oh my gosh, what is, um, I think I might just sort of saw an error. <laughs> Look in the left illustrations. Go on. Uh, oh no, it must not be. Her name, Yogananda's uh, mother is, three Yogananda's mother and guru, it's spelled G-U-R-R-U, but that must be how they spell it. Anyway, I'll talk about illustrations. How would you, what would you think? Because after the title, after the contents pages, the contents of illustration contents page, but which mm -hmm. is your favorite picture in the book of all of the, all of the many pictures? And the one I will go first, the one I really love is the one of him and Ananda Maima. Um, I just mm -hmm. think that she's um, she looks so divine, and she just looks so like mm -hmm. she looks just so in tune with Guruji in that in that picture, and just so steeped with devotion. I don't think I've ever seen another picture of her um, that that beautiful. 
Um, and my wife was like, oh, you, 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 you you're attracted to that picture because she looks exactly like your mum. And I mm -hmm. didn't know it at the time, but apparently, yeah, she does look like my mum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. A younger version of my mum. Wow. Cool. Well, I, I guess for, for me, the, something that came to mind there um, was when Yogananda was with Mahatma Gandhi. And mm. there was something quite exciting and jovial and, and you know, childlike enthusiasm in some of the pictures I thought. You know, he's, I just got that energy. He really, really enjoyed his time during that, that period of time. Um, and that, you know, he was exploring and I think he was really happy to be back in India. And there was just something really beautiful about that, that moment when I was reading it, I thought, wow, he's, he's truly happy, isn't he? He's uh, maybe, maybe he uh, stepped away from some of the burdens of, of running a, an organization, trying to get it up to speed and some of the challenges that we heard more about in the Awake film. Um, that isn't necessarily covered in this book, uh, but uh, he seemed really happy there. So that's probably for me something that stands out. I I really like the story of that little boy Kashi, who actually he Guruji predicted his um, passing, mm -hmm. and then he um, would promise him that he would find him and um, bring him back on the path. And then you have this whole story where he goes out. I don't want to spoil everything. We're going to talk about this. Um, mm -hmm. And I found it amazing that they put a picture of Kashi in the book. And um, that kind of made it even more real, the whole story. Nice. I was, the, the, the thing is, his name was Kashi in his previous life and in his um, uh, reincarnation, right? So I'm guessing the picture was taken, his reincarnated self. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. So many, so many moments. Lauren, does any, any stand up for you? Do you want to? Um, for me, it's always going to be an image apology. In my uh, apology. copy, it's on yeah. page three, four, one. I think it's probably because, I mean, we'll we'll delve into it later on, but it it does say under his image, you know, that he did not reveal any of his, um, you know, nice. uh, facts about his birthplace and and things like that. So yes, Priyanka's holding an image up for anyone watching on YouTube. So it's, it's that first time that you actually see a likeness of, of him in his fleshly form. And apparently Yogananda actually helped someone draw that image. I just think it just hits home because the story is very, very amazing. And we will delve into that later on in another episode. But yes, yeah. that's mine. That's a very good choice, Lauren. Mm. Very good choice. I must, I might have to change my decision. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> there you go something to meditate on isn't it mm. a face I often I often do that yeah. that face Babaji's face mm. just saying the name what is it Prank? uttering the name brings you blessings mm. instant instant instant, instant, blessings. instant, 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 instant spiritual instant blessings, blessings. Yeah. nice yeah yeah, because you don't want to wait a lifetime for the blessing. You want it instantly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> There's an instant gratification <laughs> society that we're living in. And it's Dwapara, ascending Dwapara yoga. <laughs> not on trip feed but there you go there's there's a couple of things for for listeners maybe to think about and challenge them to interact and you know say what's your favorite picture mm. what's your favorite chapter please you know share for fun you know where there's there's always a unique uh, and individual take on these things so um uh yeah uh, there's that uh, in the contents page now this contents page um i wondered actually uh the content in general, Priyank, I think we talked about it before. Uh, this is, you know, my, my, my thoughts on this is that it's a, it's a living um, body of work, you know, it's a living, breathing body of work. Um, and it really is quite a complex piece, um, trying to take all the complexities in Yogananda's life uh, is uh, put it, put it into words. And of course, it is more of a, a window into the path of Kriya Yoga. Uh, and taking the lessons as well. So uh, there's going to be a lot that obviously Yogananda isn't going to put, put in there. So um, he worked on it a lot himself and there were many additions, improvements um, and it's a constant work in progress. So the there are bits that obviously get dropped and get changed throughout, throughout time. Um, but the content itself, as I mentioned, you know, you talked about this a little, little bit, maybe the chronological order and things maybe jump uh, what, what's your take on this kind of is this structure in the content uh, as it 
should be or could be um he's he has he has jumped um for example he mentions lahim hashai uh in pretty much the first chapter his parents you know being being devotees of this illustrious guru but really he talks in infinite more depth about him you know 30 40 chapters later um uh, so you could and same similar with babaji um and in the first first lines he talks about he just talks about his guru straight away in his first line the in, you know guru disciple relationship so like you have to mm -hmm. you have to um wait <laughs> so on the first time you read it um you may have like scammed or gl um, glimpsed all the chapters and then like lauren mm -hmm. she would have seen that picture of babaji and probably wanted to read that chapter straight away mm -hmm. but no you mustn't <laughs> i told my i told my someone my um my wife was like um why don't you why don't you get your sisters to read this chapter on uh, the swami sri yukteswar the resurrection of swami sri yukteswar um because it was relevant for for some some part of our life and i said no you can't just jump to that chapter there's 40 <laughs> 42 other chapters that are preparation for that chapter so perhaps that is why you know even though chronologically it may not make sense to talk about someone and then talk about him in detail 50 chapters 40 mm -hmm. chapters later but in terms of a preparation because it is a it's a process reading this book is is a sadhana is a process isn't it of, of your own kind of unfoldment your own things that you may know never mm -hmm. have heard about or if you have heard about it like i have most of these things never have i heard it said so succinctly and perfectly as as yogananda has and never has it like really entered that marrow of my my psyche so even for me that's read about many of these um, many of these concepts and also experience them in other teach you know other teach through other teachers and you know uh, the characters are some you know they're, they're they're like they're very famous like you know Rabindranath Tagore and Gandhi etc but with when Guruji talks about them that's uh, completely different it adds that um, the richness that potentially uh, well certainly in my case that I didn't I didn't ever have uh, for example with Gandhi I I uh, yeah we'll go to it we'll get to that when we get to the Gandhi mm -hmm. chapter but yeah Mike I I totally agree I I also treat this book as gospel and I um, read it with a lot of reverence but at the same time if someone has never read it and they just read an excerpt of it somewhere maybe that's the part that gets them hooked and then so I would not um, say like you shouldn't you have to start from the beginning if there's like a, a part that <laughs> particularly interests you maybe that's that's your way into the book it's funny you say uh what you say Priyank, in modern uh science or mo modern modern learning there is a methodology of uh, trying to hit people with all the information as succinctly as possible at the very beginning of you know a body of text and then actually going back reverting to the beginning again uh, and parsing out all the details so there's something about hitting somebody with that the, the kind of ending almost and then and then you can work backwards uh there's there's a science behind that now um so maybe, when did maybe that when did that science come out because you're gonna definitely did that with the first paragraph you know the search the search the the search the guru disciple relationship you know that and then he talked yeah. that's the first lines two lines and, and then 40 something chapters later it talks about his guru and then yeah comes back full circle um well you controversially or not but it's cia that used you saw this <laughs> tech technique <laughs> edit this so, out so we're gonna have so, to edit this yeah, out. yeah 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 but it's no it's a great it's a, you know a way to teach and and and, and to learn uh that i think was uh first came out in the 60s or 70s so yeah certainly after after this uh after this in the 40s um 45 that it was published so yeah. possibly, as you say, Guru Guruji was well aware of how to plant the seed <laughs> and wait and let it grow. Um, yeah, going back, to Mike, to your point about uh, maybe they was maybe this person was supposed to read this section of the autobiography of Yogi, but the um, resurrection of the Sri Yukteswar, that chapter you will recall, is uh, <laughs> infinite, infinite detail and uh, some radical and profound concepts on on things would you, that that chapter would you suggest someone could go straight into that chapter 
depends on the person if they're they have some kind of spiritual openness then maybe uh i mean other otherwise the whole book is um very difficult to grasp right if you are very close-minded then this this entire book you will you will you will basically say oh okay this there is a saint who has two bodies and there is a saint <laughs> levitating <laughs> perfume out of his hand and like you know you will just say no i don't want that but you're right this this chapter is definitely um explaining a lot of concepts that are that are very new that's what makes it so fascinating though mm -hmm. lauren yeah going on from that <clears throat> excuse me i wonder well perhaps if this book is exactly like reading scripture like Bhagavad Gita or the Bible or any other scripture like that, in the sense that if you read the whole text from beginning to end, you're going to get that full, deep understanding, which you can then understand in your own inner realization. But if you do read certain sections, you are still going to learn you're still going to find something in there which is valuable and which speaks to your soul in some way, just like you would pull out parts of the scripture or that you'd read over and over again and, and really put that into your own understanding. So it feels like this book is kind of like that. For me, beginning to end is the way to go because it gives me that, that breadth. But I, yeah, I do think you could potentially dip in and out in the beginning if you were so inclined to just dip your toe for a little while. Mm. Well, for, for me, one of, one of the most awesome things about having a guru um, is the dedication and commitment to one another over lifetimes. And it's that eternal love that's, you know, we're bere it's bereft in, in modern society, really, with even friends and family. Um, and that's what makes it so special, isn't it? That personal relationship with your girly over over lifetimes. So, how long has this book been out for? <clears throat> There's every chance any one of us or any of our listeners, our audience has read that book many times in the past <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> so you know you could say, hey, well, somebody listening, so, you know, anybody could really have a, a quick affiliation to be able to pick it up and you know jump into different chapters and say, hey, you know, I, I really. Feel like I've maybe already read this, so um, who knows? We we don't all. It's not all a a even keel uh, and even balanced life that we're all that we're all on. Which, uh, as Sri Yukteswar uh, said, thank God for that. Essentially, and I'm I'm <laughs> I'm uh, abbreviating there, but he did say you know complexities and um, differentiation is uh, is one of the most beautiful things about about life. So who knows? Who knows? Uh, Priyank. Yeah, nice, uh, nice paraphrasal there, Mike, Chris. I know the exact <laughs> bit that you're talking about, but even though I wouldn't yeah. want to venture to quote it. Um, yeah, back to the recommending this book and me telling someone not to go straight to chapter 42. It's my my limited uh, capability to do things that are not in an ordered and structured way. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably my weakness. I have to go from page one to page 300. I can't go, you know, straight, go in and out. Um, and that's with virtually every walk of my life, whether I don't know if that's a strength or a weakness, but I'll let uh, God decide when that time comes. <laughs> um, but it, the other things, you know, just today, someone, we were, I was on a training course and the trainer asked me, what's your favorite book? And I was like, I have to, obviously going to have to say, I'm doing a podcast in two hours. I said, oh, it's the autobiography of yogi. She's like, oh, what's what's that about? And I said, oh, it's about a yogi. And she's like, what's a yogi? And I explained what a yogi was, someone who practices yoga. And um, she said, what's it about? And I said, ooh, which, what do I say here? Because she's obviously um, uh, interested. Um, and I could say one of 49 chapters and talk about any one of those chapters. Which chapter would you guys have said? I judge. I judged. I kind of like what, what would like get her interest the most. So I talked about like the supernatural elements, for example. Um, I said to her, "Oh, there's a, you know this this yogi who was a self realized master, and um, he you know he, he attained to, so, to enlightenment, as you would have heard from Buddha." And she said, "Oh, that's interesting." And I said, "This book is about his experiences with." 
with meeting other people that are of the same ilk, for example, then I immediately went to the Tiger Swami chapter, like <laughs> fighting, mm. fighting this, you know, this, this person who was famous in India, he used to fight tigers with his bare hands and he became really famous. And this guru, this guru met, um, met this person and she was intrigued. What would you have said? Or what do you say if someone uh, comes up with that question, Chris? The answer, as I think is the answer to almost everything in life, is it depends. Yeah. Um, if you were to find that somebody's background is. No, they're not. Needed. So assume that they're not. Assume that they're, they're not. Any uh, kind of into religion? This, into this stuff, yeah. <clears throat> any spiritual, not no, even Christi yeah, Christianity. Yeah. Not, no, she wasn't okay, into I, any of this stuff. What would, say, you, what would you have said? Um, that there's. You know that it covers the mysteries of life about the the fantastical and the and the seemingly impossible that is well ahead of its time I, I would have tried to capture imagination that give it give it give it a chance because if she's asking you clearly she well you would think that maybe they're open-minded enough to say hey okay well i'm interested tell me more about it so i may may have talked about that that there's the sign again we go back to that tw chapter 26 science of kriya yoga my favorite <laughs> uh, probably my favorite chapter that there may be, there may be more mathematical precision behind the yoga that you you may know and that for me if somebody said that to me i would say okay sold you know i'll I'll read that book um 10 years ago if somebody had said that to me i'd probably yeah say that interesting yeah but uh controversially maybe you could mention if they were to, you know with the background with Christianity that uh, Yogananda talks a lot about Jesus uh, and talks about having uh, essentially met with Jesus uh, on more than one occasion, having had visions uh, of Jesus Christ. So um, that's something that really would capture many many imagination. Now, I'm sure. Uh, Mike, you're on mute. Yeah. I I usually talk about the benefits that I I get from being on the path and that's usually how I explain it to people like like the effect of meditation on my life how it gives me peace it gives me strength it gives me direction it gives me strength in my intuition gives me happiness like those are all the things that I I kind of um describe to people usually and I so, sometimes it resonates. It really depends, like Chris said. But yeah, mm. I think what Yogananda does is take concepts that are well beyond the grasp of <laughs> the majority of of us human beings on on the face of the earth, and uh, makes them real, and makes you know puts them into your vision. And I think Yogananda talks about intelligence and intuition and these things that build your intuition that you can re you can really rely on it. Um, and intuitively, I think many people know that this, you know, these truths are there. So uh, that's that's something. Um, whether you read it as pure entertainment, and you know, maybe that plants a seed into your subconscious that might grow over this lifetime and into the next, uh, it's worthwhile reading though, because um, they're they're universal truths. That I think we all could agree that uh, you know we we take uh, for absolute truth. Yogananda talks about it in great detail and can make the very complex simple as well. So uh, it's it's just a great book of wisdom in that regard. Priyank? My um, younger brother-in-law, who Mike, you know, he asked, um, he likes my travel altar. And he's like, why don't you give me one of those travel altars and I'll keep it on my desk at work. And he works for a big hedge fund in the city mm -hmm. um so you can imagine the types of people that, that are um, in his on his desk on his trading floor etc and um i said yeah you can but uh people may consider that you, you may be they may perceive you as pretty hardcore like religiously with, with this with this picture you can do it but there's, there could be some negatives for you in terms of how people perceive you and i thought about myself would i do it and my career is pretty much like this trajectory is set i know i know where it's going to peak and where it's going to plateau so it wouldn't really make that much difference for me but even me like i think i've, I've shared this like i've got a picture of um guruji writing at his desk um, and it's a black and white picture and i keep it under my monitor and it kind of looks like um obviously it's guru we know who guruji is it's it's will be very obvious that it's guruji and it's a lovely picture 
um, and it's like a sideways shot that that picture and mm -hmm. it looks like um, because he's working it kind of inspires me to you know to work 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 to work with that much more dedication but um if anyone looked at that they would be like oh that's that must be your um grandfather or your father or your uncle likes a black and white shot and then if they do ask then I can obviously no this is my this is my guru so I, I would approach it in a more um subtle way would you would you guys keep a um travel altar on your desk and be prepared for the uh inquisition that would no doubt come and the judgments no <laughs> <laughs> uh, no I don't think so we should rename um, you Frank I think <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a simple, simple answer to that. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, and I, I think maybe uh, in my work, I can say this much that we have yoga classes, we have mindfulness meditation classes, uh, and it's beautiful. But there's a very small group of people uh, that maybe attend. So, so I'd say ninety plus percent of people you'd have a hard time with. Ten percent of people would get it and they would you'd be with it, but you know. There might be some deviations in there, um, but you're probably asking for more trouble than what is necessarily, uh, uh, ne you know, what's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, nowadays with Zoom meetings, you can have the guru as, the, as your background, like the actual SRF author. Well, wow. I, 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 I have, I have the, book, the book up there at the minute. It's, it's Priyanki, you have the picture of Guruji there. And I almost forgot to take my book stop because, you know, it's maybe... <laughs> You know, maybe maybe not necessarily appropriate at some some meetings for some people if they do ask about it. Not that that's necessarily obvious. I think, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Lauren, jump in. Well, I don't have a desk, so this isn't really applicable to me. Um, but I do think it's sort of where you are in your own spiritual development, and less about other people's perception. So I think when you're in the beginning, everything kind of feels like you want it to be very insular and you want to keep it close because, you know, you're just you're just finding your way with guru and God and finding out what that means for you. So I think for me anyway, to put that on display for the whole, you know, world or, you know, for people who I work with to see, I think that wouldn't be spiritually conducive to my development. But however, if I felt it would be, you know, I think I think it just depends on where you're at, doesn't it? In your own little path. Um, yeah. Nice words. <clears throat> Food nice for words. thought. I may tell yeah. him to may tell my brother-in-law to keep the book of the autobiography on his desk. I think that's a bit more subtle, would you say? But the fact that he would like to put it on his desk, maybe there is something in that. Maybe him having it there one day, someone who's meant to see it will see it. And they'll begin their own their own journey. You never know. There's reasons I'm, for everything. I'm hoping he himself sees it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, try to twist his twist his arm to meditate. Or the Guruji's zapping you every time you looked on his book. Maybe maybe it would work. Um, alrighty. So we we covered the contents then. Um, I think uh, in in good enough detail. Uh, let's get on to really what is going to be a more chunky piece of uh, material, the preface. Now, this is by W. Y. Evans once, and there's a whole, uh, yeah, there's a whole um, uh, two or three uh, abbreviations after his name. He's, he's um, been, he's got his master's and bachelor's and doctor of science. Uh, so he wrote a very lovely page and a half on the preface. And this is quite a, an exalted position, I think, to hold uh, for uh, somebody who maybe you wouldn't have heard of, or you know, you don't really hear much about him uh, in many other texts. So this is somebody who kind of comes in, has clearly had a really important part to play in Gurdjieff's life and in, with SRF. And he's been given the honors to, to write this preface. And we'll talk about why this might be in, in a minute or two. Uh, but first off, it's a it's a wonderful um, position to really have, have held because uh, Guruji has obviously handpicked this individual to, to write this. Uh, so he could have picked many people, I'm sure. He, he did uh, know many people in his lifetime that I'm sure would have been gladly, uh, uh, you know, very willingly um, putting pen to paper to, to write something for Guruji. But no, uh, it was Evans Wentz. Uh, so let's uh, maybe talk about 
who this is first and foremost before we jump into really what uh, is uh, covered in this preface but first off Priyank do you have something yeah. that you would like to share just before we start in in his um, in who he is um, in in the author's acknowledgement so he obviously says he acknowledges three people uh, Tara Mata, Richard Wright and Evans Wentz but he he actually says I'm grateful not just for his preface but also his suggestions mm -hmm. and encouragement for the book would seem so that would that would imply that he actually had um, some sway in mm -hmm. in Guruji's eyes in terms of like what he should put in the book which mm -hmm. is very interesting isn't it because that puts him in quite a high <laughs> quite, quite a high estimation and uh, especially for all of us who love love the book because that would imply that he actually uh, in whatever portion he actually he actually influenced Guruji in what he should include so I thought that was quite interesting yeah yeah it's a very good point and maybe alluding to that then he, he himself was quite accomplished you would say a pioneer of the study of Tibetan Buddhism himself he was uh, giving credit for the translations and, and the bringing over of the Tibetan Buddhism uh, into the western world so uh, really akin to what Guruji did in, in many ways bringing the east to the west so maybe he felt a particular affiliation with, with him for, for that reason, or one of, one, of, one of the reasons, maybe that. Um, and he published uh, a few texts, and I know, Prank, maybe you, you want to talk about this, uh, if you want to talk about it now or later. But um, uh, one of... Let's do it later, but let's talk about later, him yeah. first. Yeah, him first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we can get into this, but uh, they're, they're well-known, very well-known books. So, so he uh, clearly had a, a great uh, impact on bringing some of the more Eastern philosophies to the West, uh, which is beautiful. But his his mother was Irish, um, great, uh, great to see, as a fellow Irishman here. <laughs> Completely tri tri tribally biased, inevitably. Um, his father? But, but his father, exactly like, was German. Um, wood, wood. Uh, <laughs> and the, the father was a, a successful businessman, and he was in, um, I believe, in the in property business um, but his and, spirit he, his spirit his soul belonged to india as we know so yeah 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 his spirit is, is universal correct it's, uh, but lauren um, uh, he went to oxford and did his stuff so you can claim some english there as well i mean <laughs> we're really clutching our straws there aren't we <laughs> yeah um, so so yes german german father uh, irish mother um, so that hence the, the name, uh, the, the Waltz, uh, Evan Waltz uh, name, W-A-L-T-Z. Um, so he uh, he actually was very well off. Uh, and I, I thought I'd mention this at, at the get-go because um, I guess a lot of these things craft, you know, who we are as, as people, what we can do in life and so on and so forth in, in many ways. But he, he, I saw or did some research. I almost fell off my seat. Um, he really... He was against capitalism, actually, quite interestingly, to, to begin with the philosophy, I suppose, of capitalism. Um, but he, I suppose, embraced it in some way because his, he was brought into the business that his, his father was in, and he was very successful. So he was funded a lot of what he did, which was travel around Mexico, Europe, and the Far East. Um, he uh, he did extensive travel, and, and he was funded a lot by this rental property business that he had in Florida, which... Uh, it was equal to um, uh, $43,000 per month uh, in, in today's money, which is huge. Um, so he clearly had ample finances behind it, but he spent it wisely, uh, I think is uh, uh, something to note here. He really sought, uh, sought many, uh, many mysteries in the world. Um, he, he went um, during the First World War to Egypt, uh, and he was in Sri Lanka, where he really studied the Buddhism uh, philosophy, and uh, yeah, many other countries. Uh, going to India, where he met uh, Sri Yukteswar there, and that's really going to play a big part in this preface that we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, and he was essentially he was seeking wise men of the East. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he met uh, many spiritual figures uh, in his endeavors, such as Yogananda, as we know. Um, so Priyak. Yeah, so in? he said he knew Yogananda in the East, uh, sorry, in India and America. And he went to India the first time, like in the late 1910s and the early 20s. And mm -hmm. um, so I, be I believe from what I've researched, he probably would have met 
Yogananda when before he actually went to America for however briefly it was because um then when he was back uh, uh Yogananda when Yogananda was back in um oh sorry when Yogananda was in in America and that's when um Evans went went back to India in 30 in the late mid 30 in the 20s and met Sri Yukteswar so um yeah so I think he would have met Yogananda uh, early on and then met obviously mm -hmm. later on as well yeah yeah and really really blessed and clearly you know magnets drawn to each other mm. uh and you know he, he was drawn to to srf and yogananda <clears throat> but he originally he was a baptist so he was raised as a baptist um and i kind of had when i was reading reading this i had some affiliation toward him because being raised a protestant um you know he, he said that as as he grew older the family his family began to embrace the ideas of spiritual spiritualist ideas more free thinking ideas Bear in mind, this is you know a whole different century to, to, to the century we're in today. So um, a little bit uh, different, I think it's safe to say, Christianity in the early, early 20th century um, than what it is today. Um, so reincarnation, he didn't note that he actually held a grudge, could you believe, against Christians, Christianity, sorry, more, more, more appropriately, more specifically, um, uh, because the reincarnation, uh, he said that it was the single, single thread that ran through all of his work. And he saw in all religions and i suppose this is maybe a second reason why he really felt uh, akin to yogananda being the you know science uh, science of yoga is uh, uh, the truth uh, truth in all religions uh, that yogananda teaches um but he, he uh, didn't like the way that he thought christianity uh, may have subdued or 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 withdrew or abandoned the doctrine of reincarnation so he thought this was the Gnostic Christians uh, doctrine, and it was abandoned over time. And I think I've mentioned this a few times, I've known that, uh, you know, early Christianity may have really embraced in reincarnation, but uh, later maybe scrubbed it from, from some of their history. So, so that is something interesting that I saw that I wanted to share. Uh, but you could talk, you know, probably uh, for a whole, uh, episode at least on this individual, but he did enroll in Stanford University at the age of 24 and went, uh, uh, you know, he did a, he did a master's uh, as well as a bachelor's there. Um, and he later went to Oxford, as Craig said, in 1907 when he was, I think, 29. So he was accomplished as an academic, uh, but he interestingly did go on to, uh, at o Oxford, to pursue very faith and this is something that I've never heard of before, fairy faith. And I, it is, as it sounds, actually, he was very curious about uh, pixies, fairies, you know, goblins. He traveled through Wales, Scotland and Ireland, you know, my neck of the woods, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, Brittany and the Isle of Man, you know, collecting stories about these, uh, this phenomena. So he clearly was a very open-minded individual that sought, uh, tried to seek truth. And um, I don't know the results of his, searches but if anybody does know please share them with us uh, it is quite interesting so very interesting individual yeah he, he wrote a uh, book about it i think one of his first yeah. books was about that okay the fairies yeah on the reading list <laughs> uh, so who knows maybe i can go out into my back garden in ireland and sit down and maybe see some fairies and pixies i'll look out for them next time but um reading this preface then let's move on to that uh a couple of things i noted Frank, you said um if you were to talk to somebody about the autobiography of a yogi what would you say well it's a book about a yogi or well, maybe uh, our dear friend here would disagree with you because he described the book as uh, the value of the autobiography is really that it's a book about yogis by a yogi and i love that take because essentially that kind of is what it is you know yogananda talks a lot about you know other yogis he doesn't necessarily go into too much detail on himself and we know that from maybe the contrast to the awake documentary where there's so many stories about yogananda's life in particular that are maybe not in the autobiography of a yogi and for specific reasons that i'm sure yogananda didn't want to go into but it's a really beautiful take on that it's a, it's a book about yogis by a yogi lauren do you want to jump in yeah, I remember when I first read the book, I remember thinking, why is he talking so much about other people, you know, and then it's dawned on me now that perhaps 
he saw and felt and knew the oneness of all that were yogis and all that was self-realized and actually even though there are different names and souls in this book they are all essentially one right because they are they are with god so it's it's about different yogis but it's the same right just the different reflections and forms which is a really wonderful thought actually because it, it appeals to all in whatever walks of life you're from or whatever stage you are you'll probably see yourself reflected in this book from the different souls that were reincarnated at that time which is really fascinating mm -hmm. yeah yeah beautiful beautiful comment yeah correct yeah and i i really like that the um that he put um not not by a journalist or a foreigner in the line mm. um but one of you know one of their own race and training um because he's he is essentially that that journalist and foreigner in india for, for a large part mm. of his life so like he you know he wrote he wrote uh, a books in conjunction uh, the tibetan books he wrote in conjunction with the, with the lama that he met um so the, the lama knew all the you know he could translate the the, the books etc the, the the scripts that he had but um walter had to actually do the writing and in conjunction so he he was this kind of like means that he, it's difficult isn't it to be a translator and a writer at the same time whereas yogananda is the both he, he is both and those he is the, he, he's he's the author and he's he's um he's translating because his mother tongue guruji's mother tongue is obviously mm -hmm. uh, ben bengali so um i thought he was talking it's interesting he, uh, he's actually talking about himself there i think as the not by a journalist or foreigner and there's a bit of credence to that because uh some of his some of his work uh was it came under some scrutiny because of um because of how he translated and where he got his scripts from and things like that so i think he's um really appreciating that guruji was in a supreme place to to undertake this monumental work yeah really good point uh mike you're on mute was not only um, a yogi but he was also a yogi who has gone to the west was very well read about western literature and he was basically of both worlds right and you could say in the same way Guruji chose um Evans Wentz to write the preface because he also was a bit of both worlds right he was a westerner who who spent a lot of time, like you said, uh, Chris, in Sri Lanka, in India. He even met Guruji before he even came to the West. He would have met him anyways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he met Sri Yukteswar and um, very beautifully describes um, Sri Yukteswar in the preface. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of something East, East meets West, this whole preface, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that that's... That that is something that I think is truly noteworthy. That two thirds of this acknowledgement really is to Sri Yukteswar, uh, essentially, um, and that uh, he talked about meeting Sri Yukteswar Ji and uh, the impressions and accomplishments of this great, great, uh, great soul, um, and how he was, uh, you know, an engine behind Yogananda really, but uh, was quite removed from all the activities in, in the United States. And um, I'm sure quite, uh, uh, you know, looking on with fondness and everything. Uh, but he did, he did go into detail, really, two, at least two thirds of the of the text here is what um, Sri Tishwaji. And whenever I read this, I thought, well, A, it's significant that um, he's spending his time to uh, talk about this great soul um, in the way that he's talking about it. Um, but B, how great is it that Yogananda wants, you know, wants to have this in there front and center? And when I was reading it, I could just hear Yogananda's devotion. You know what I mean? I could just see the outpouring of love that Yogananda has for his guru. He wanted to put his guru in there and probably saw, you know, in advance that this may be the content that uh, would come out of it. And he thought this is appropriate. Um, as we talked about, you know, it's uh, one of the first things that Guruji really talks about in the autobiography of a yogi is his guru. So it's in the preface uh, as well, Lauren. Yeah. And I think also on the flip side of what you're saying, Chris, is, you know, for the skeptical 
among us in the world who may think, well, who is Palmer Hunks or Yogananda and what does he know? Well, actually, a lot of times you can go as far as your teacher, right? So if his teacher is this incredible person and soul, it gives the author credibility, right? And I mean, not that he, not that he needs it, but <laughs> for, the, for those who are yeah. skeptical, I think it adds that, that extra layer of actually you're about to embark on something that is that is that goes back further than just this person that you see on the front page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And credit to, you know, to um, Mr. Evans Waltz here as well as maybe Lauren, you said earlier that he identified, you know, the importance of the book. He did say the words timely and timeless in describing the autobiography of a yogi. And I thought, okay, well, here's somebody who really, who at the time, truly recognized the achievement of the book and its purpose to bring the East to the West. And as I mentioned, you know, maybe he's uniquely placed because how many people at the time were doing this? You know, he there was somebody who was spending his money and time traveling all over the world, trying to bring, and he was successful in doing so. Maybe we can go on to talking about this now, Priyank, the books that he really brought over um, about the Tibetan Buddhism and things like this. He was successful in doing so. So he really no noticed and he was riding that same wave that Yogananda was, was riding eff effectively or bringing to the shores of our, of our consciousness, uh, was bringing, bringing the, the beautiful philosophies of, of these to, to the West. So, so yeah, really, really awesome stuff. Now, the books that he brought, shall we talk about this in a little bit more detail? Do you want to take us away, Frank? Yeah, I can do that. I just thought I'd also mention that. Um, so he may he, he met Sri Yogeshwar in nine, mid nineteen thirties. So he may have met Yogananda again in India, but he didn't mention this uh, after mm. um, in any of his his writing and or in the biography, um, because there's a biography written about him, and that is by is, is by Ken Winkler. And it's called The Pilgrim of the Clear Light. It's kind of it's kind of his like. Um, uh, disciple, as it were, um, and he's a, he's a Buddhist as well, and it's the the biography of Dr. Walter Evans went. So so I read I read through mm -hmm. uh, some of that in preparation for this, and um, yeah, it doesn't. It's curious that he doesn't mention where and exactly when he met him, but uh, yeah, so it could have been mm -hmm. before he left India. What after he met Sri Yukteswar as well, he would have met um, Yogananda again, and obviously most certainly he met him in India. But also in um, the latter phases of um, of his life, um, he attended meetings in in San Diego under under where where, where Guruji was, um, and he also uh, Yogananda actually invited him to come and stay um, stay in in Encinitas, which he did, and mm -hmm. he spent the the last few years of his. Um, of his life there before before he passed away and um in um i think somewhere in california they've got a, a stupa which is a buddhist um uh, it's like a buddhist monument dedicated to to him which is yeah. uh, quite nice um yeah. so yeah so in these books um <laughs> these are some epic books so the three books are tibetan yoga and the secret doctrines the tibet's great yogi Midarapa. Uh, but the revolutionary one was the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, the reason it was revolutionary because Tibetan Tibetan Buddhism um, really the reason it became known to the West and therefore the rest of the world, other than you know a part of uh, North India as it was back then, um, it really only came into knowledge, mainstream awareness, especially academic circles, because of these works that. Um, that uh, Dr. Evans once produced, and um, they they are absolutely epic. So um, I, I uh, managed to get a copy of each of those books, and um, absolutely phenomenal. So the 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 Tibetan Book of the Dead is a translation. Is th those words are a translation of the um, the title is called Bardo. Uh, Bard is like a it's the Indian word uh, which means like in between, and Do is the number two. So in between, like two places so the book of dead you can imagine it means in between death and rebirth and the reason it's important is uh, yeah chris i want to pull you up on this correct? yes yes because i read somewhere that there's speculation that exists out there that the 
uh, translation of the Egyptian Book of the Dead uh, was was incorrect. What not the Egyptian. I, 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 Freudian oh, slipped I? there, Chris. You said the oh. Egyptian Egyptian Book of the Dead. He deliberately called it actually the Tibetan Book of the, the Dead because of the uh, because of the famous previous book, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Actually, but oh, yeah, the, uh, but, but, it, but the script the, the book is called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Right. Yes, got you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, you're apparently, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There was some controversy surrounding the original scrolls that he that he found about this book, um, yeah. about about the the scripture, the the the, the Bardor scripture, um, and uh, whether it was authentic, etc. Mm -hmm. But the point is, so as a um, academic exercise, you may you may. Um, uh, Go on, so let, let me just finish that yeah. because um, the, the, apparently the suggestion of the more literal translation for this, and you probably have read a little bit more about this than I have, mm -hmm. Greg, is the book of liberation by hearing in the intermediate states. And when I heard that, I thought about the teachings in Korea. You know, you're you're listening to this, you know, the sounds of the chakras, or you know, you're you're kind of listening to the Om vibration in the right ear. That's what came to mind when I read that and thought, wow, I wonder if there's something to that. But that's that's what I heard. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you weren't talking so much about the controversy surrounding his authorship. <laughs> no. No, um, no. But yeah, no, I'll, no, I'll get no, to no, that. So Bardo means the in-between uh, two states. And the reason it was it caught the imagination of the um of the West is because Christianity and the Western religions do not deal with this uh with this um kind of intermediary phase very well uh, as much as eastern eastern religions do and and buddhism and tibet tibetan buddhism has really gone to like the nth degree of studying this and how to make the most of this time uh, and in their um in their uh, in, in their theory um there's between 0 to 49 days after the soul has left that body and takes rebirth where yeah so it's, it could take up to 49 days so if it does take 49, so zero days would be, for example, if someone became realized in the first straight away after leaving their body, and there would be obviously no 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 more birth nirvana, as you may call it. Um, but the second the second and third stage is where like you're not liberated, um, but you can choose potentially choose your next birth depending on um, you know uh, what what your experiences were in this life and what your level of realization was and then the third and fourth states are basically compulsively just based on your karma where, where you take rebirth so the, the 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 importance of this book is that in those 49 days you can do some sadhana you can do some work to actually propel yourself a bit further along in your spiritual journey and this is actually the essentially the crux of the tibetan buddhist um importance on the place on the spiritual master because when when you pass away um this is when you can actually you've got a really good opportunity to become to go to, go to a much uh, higher state of uh, of existence so that's that's the that's mm -hmm. what essentially what uh, the tibetan book of the dead is and if you get the third edition of the book you know, it's quite interesting because um He's um he's written he's written himself the introduction to each of those books and the preface. So he's written the preface to his own books because of this uh, whole controversy surrounding the scripture and et cetera. So he's actually then everything. So any every, every time they re-released it, it was like 10 years on. So it's like it shows you 10 years of his like growth, as it were, because he's he talks about his um his experiences, et cetera. Um mm -hmm. and in in the book, um the the Secret doctrines, Tibet's sorry, Tibetan yoga and secret doctrines. He actually has a picture of Sri Yogeshwar in there, which is really mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, and he's he talks about the you know the masters of India and, and Sri Yogeshwar. He is obviously he's obviously one of them. But the 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 work of art actually I think is um and that that secret Tibetan yoga and secret doctrines is really just about breaking down in in a number of chapters breaking down the concepts of of Buddhism which are not dissimilar to um you know things that we're taught and um, other, mm -hmm. other hindu things mm -hmm. hindu concepts nice good contribution to the world i think but the, bringing that over yeah i was going to talk about the tibet's mm -hmm. great if you allow me a few more minutes the, the big book is the tibet's great yogi bilarapa do you do we have time um we always have time for this it's, it's <laughs> very reason, interesting stuff so crack on 
um, uh, this I realize I've done a lot of talking, but Milarepa is a very famous uh, yogi um, in in North India and in in Tibetan Buddhism in Nepal and South China. Um, so I, I've been to Nepal a number of times and I've been to Tibet uh, three times. And um, if, if you go to like the north part of, of Nepal, where um, where it's a very mountainous mountainous area, um, and it's touching touching borders with uh, Tibet, there's always there's every little not every there's lots of little caves and little mountains and peaks, and they're all dedicated. This you know Milarepa meditated here, or Milarepa left his body here, or you you know established a shrine here, etc. So I wanted to talk to you quickly about his name was Jetsun Milarepa, and he's um, quite a quite a yogi, I might say. Um, Mike knows a bit about him. I'll allow him to come in a second because you read a book, didn't you, Mike? Um, or you saw a book? But he essentially is a short biography about him. So he he was he was born into a, quite a wealthy family, but his parents passed away, and his uncle was um, looking after him. Um, and this this is the, the classic case of the evil aunt and uncle because uh they they he was there uh, quite suppressed and anyway so he he did this thing called tantra he learned he went away and learned tantra and tantra is so so there's three concepts there's mantra which is the sound and the yantra which is the form and tantra is the science of manifesting what you want from the sound to the form so he learned this tantra which uh basically he he made like hailstones like giant hailstones he basically killed his um killed his uncle using essentially black magic but uh you, you can't just perform tantra it's uh it's a quite a dedicate it's a quite a process of learning the science etc so he had to repent and he repented he went under the tutelage of his guru which was uh marapa and mike you found a book about what he had to do to repent but you tell us about that quickly yeah i when i was in hidden valley um, at the time, definitely 15 years ago, there was a, a book about Milarepa that people were talking about there, and um, it was very easily written. So um, it was basically about like what you just said. So he had this, call him Guru Marpa, right? He And he, um, Milarepa was living a bit of a not so spiritual life before, right? So... He, I think he was known as like a, a murderer and things like that, right? So mm -hmm. he, he, he wasn't the kind of person where he thought of as a, as a spiritual person. And so I, I guess maybe that's why Marpa gave him tasks that were very difficult to do. And one of the famous ones is that he had to build him a, a castle or a tower um, in the harsh um, highlands of, of Tibet, right? Where you don't have anything right you have to bring everything there uh, um like take boulders push them up the mountain and then put, put them into place and and then he he built a tower for him and then marpa came and was like yeah all right but how about you put this build it again a bit more to the right and so he had him build three towers at the end of the day um until until he was happy and funny enough i i uh, today i I looked that up and I actually, this tower actually stood for a very long time and it was only destroyed in 1980 in the Cultural Revolution of China. So it was actually very good quality tower that he built. Mm -hmm. So Milarepa is the 11th, 11th century. So you can imagine this has stood for 900 or so years. But yeah, so so Marapa was, uh, he, he the, the practices he made Milarepa do were very austere practices. So it like, required a lot of like deep sadhana and lots of dedication. One of the practices that he got him to do was um, basically go into a cave. <laughs> Don't leave the cave until you become enlightened. <laughs> Don't leave because you want clothes. Don't leave because you need food. Don't leave because you get bored, etc. And he, he obviously, he was, uh, he did this. And he became enlightened um, through the through these through these practices, um, and he took a vow. And after he became enlightened, would you believe this? He took a vow not to enter nirvana until all sentient creatures have been released from this plane. So that means that he is going to keep his as Sri Yukteswar is like you know he's helping um, in in the Hiranyaloka 
he's 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 not like yet merged back to the cosmic consciousness so similarly Mirapa said said that he's not going to until everyone on this planet is basically experiencing what I've have experienced I'm not going mm -hmm. to uh to go basically which is very so, cool wow. is, is is uh does that count new souls that come to the planet because mm -hmm. a thousand <laughs> years ago your population wasn't that big he said all <laughs> sentient beings heaven only knows what that that's actually means. but that, I think that's plain right not this planet it's yeah. plain yeah both. Um, so yeah so quite a quite a commitment and um which really puts him into a an avatar kind of status doesn't it uh this is not no longer just a uh mm -hmm. yogi that's realized this is now he's this is divinity the full form of divinity that's manifesting yeah chris what's the beautiful saying that uh all saints are sinners that didn't give up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he certainly didn't give up. But yeah, so that that was his uh, enlightenment story. But his his um, death story is even more cool. Um, so basically, he went to this uh, party, and um, there was a pre there was a pandit or a priest there, a learned scholar, as you will, if you will, and um, Milarapa was very well recognized as a realized master at this time and so he sat they gave him the seat in the center of the the, the center table basically at the head head of the table and this priest who was a uh, very rich very learned and like you know had lots of material wealth he was like i should be sitting there and Milarapa was like um they put me here and he's like, uh, the, this other guy was like, you need to, you know, I, I've got all this, 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 I've learned all this scripture, you don't know all this scripture, because I'm so learned, you should actually bow to me. And uh, Milarepa was like, I only bow to my guru, you know, I've, I don't bow to anyone, any, anyone or any other thing than my, uh, my guru. So then uh, this, this, um, this priest, uh, obviously, is not, uh, he became quite uh, jealous or envious of his position so he got one of his uh, ladies as it were <laughs> and he said to her all right i want you to give give me up uh, this poisoned rice so he, he, he mm -hmm. put some poison in in yogurt yogurt rice and he said you give it to her and she's like no i'm not, I'm not doing that he's a realized master and then she he said okay fine you i'll give you a turquoise uh, if you go do it turquoise is this like this mineral um, that's like very attractive and beautiful and she's like all right I'll, I'll do it <laughs> and so she um so she so she goes to him and said um I've, I've offered you here please accept my offering take this uh, yogurt uh, yogurt food and Miller was like um I won't eat, I'll accept it I won't eat it now though I'll eat it later she's like no no please have it now and he's like no no I'll, I'll have it but i'll have it later so please come back later he said to her and miller is obviously a realized master so he knows exactly what's going on and um and so she goes back to him and um he says like he's not accepting it and he then the, the guy's like okay no uh, okay we'll go back later actually let's let's listen to what he's saying and he's like no no i don't want to i don't want to i don't want to take part in this and then he actually gave her the thing he said no no you go i'm going to give you this now so you go now and do it i've given you the gift so you have to actually go i've given you the turquoise so then later on the day she goes back to him and says um here yeah, please accept this and then Milarapa says Oh, uh, you! I see you now have the turquoise. I'll now accept this um, this offering. And then she realized, oh my God, this is how how is how does he know? He must be realized. What the hell am I doing? Like poisoning a, um, a realized master? So she fell she fell at his feet, and he's like, "Get up!" The only reason I didn't accept it earlier is because you so desired that turquoise that it, you you wouldn't have um, achieved you wouldn't have fulfilled that desire now you have that turquoise i'm going to accept this and i'm going to eat this um eat this poisoned rice and she's like no no you don't eat it because of my sins i will eat it and he's like no no my time on this plane is not very long so yogis uh, lo like to find excuses to leave this will be my excuse and she's like no no let me eat it but he convinced her anyway so he ate the poisoned food um yeah <laughs> so then he that ate it. it so then no 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 it goes on it goes becomes quite magical so then um yeah so she so then so then he obviously became uh, he was becoming quite ill and he was saying like um people were offering him um like 
uh, medicine and he's like no no we don't uh, we don't accept medicine you know but they didn't accept medicine when he was uh, going through something something similar um you know they use illness for their passage and then um apparently like as as you're coming to the end of his uh illness like because people know that he knew that he was going to leave his body um or he he made it known that it was going to be soon like rainbows he started appearing and fragrances that no one had ever smelt before started coming so there's all these magical things that were happening probably chris fairies fairies started <laughs> appearing i got outside my window that's, <laughs> <laughs> um and um yeah so then they started they started arguing so the people his devotees started arguing about his body saying okay is he going to die now well, while he's still alive why don't we um, decide what to do with his body now? Whilst and he can tell us. And he said, "There's no point in you arguing. When I when I die, my there'll be no body left for you to cremate." And they were like, what 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 does that mean? And uh, he didn't explain. And then and then um, then he said, "Actually, no. I I don't want to die here anyway. I want to die in the wilderness. I don't want to die in the luxury of a home. Yogis don't die." you know, like this, they they die, they take great Mahasamadhi in, in caves, etc. So, um, so he said, you, um, I'm going to go to this cave. And um, he's like, let the young, young, young people, you go ahead and make pro provision for me in the, this cave, I'll come behind you. So uh, these young youngsters went ahead, and went to the cave, and they found him meditating there. And these, like, they obviously got there quite quickly. And he's like, how you how did you get here? And then he's like, No, I, I was just here. And then the elders who were walking with him, um, when they when they caught he was already he they, they claimed that the elders hadn't left him, so he was walking with the elders, and he had manifested himself in the cave as well. So as he was walking, then he's then now, now there's two of him. So this is now akin to the Lahiri Mahasaya right, mm -hmm. story, where he appears in two uh, after his death, where he appears in two or three places at once, right, um, and then. So then he was walking, and then people that were where the village where, where he was staying said he actually never left. He's been here all this time. So there's three places that um, he he was manifesting himself. So um, so there was that. So then he we got to this um, place and took um, took Mahasamadhi, um, and then um, they were still arguing about where to where to take his body to cremate, and all the factions of the um, uh, places or the people that wanted to take. Um, take his body to cremate that was like four places each of those four places they had a the corpse his, he manifested his corpse to each of those okay. places so they could each cremate him cremate wow. him there yeah wow it's amazing what a story yeah. i know it's all in it's all in that book the tibetan uh, the miller up the tibetan yogi that uh, that he was evans wentz has written yeah, you're not reading that in a Western school anytime <laughs> soon, mm -hmm. um, for sure. That's that's incredible. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing um, so right. sharing that. And I, I guess Evans Wentz would have been uh, reading and following these the, these stories very carefully um, and seeing the divinity uh, that certainly Yogananda had and, and Sri Yukteswar had, uh, and he chose to live his final years out with with Yogananda, as you, as he said there. Um, Priyank is, is final yeah. few months or few years. Sorry, was it? Um, I think his final few months at who? His, who's uh, Ev Evans Wentz? No, no, years. He's we spent his years, final years in in then Sydney. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 quite significant. But yeah. much, much after Yogananda's path, uh, Mahasamadhi. Interestingly, sure. uh, um, when um, uh, when what's his name? When Milarappa, when he passed. He passed with uh, his his basically pranamed his guru, Marappa, as he passed, which is quite interesting. He uh, what, what do you mean? Sorry? Pranamed as in he he, he uh, offered his um, offered his worship to his guru oh, just wow. before he took his uh, took his mahasamadhi. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. which is a nice way to to end this mm -hmm. uh, episode, really, because as we pranamed to Yogananda, as he you know, essentially pranam to his his guru in this beautiful um, uh, preface uh, and making that space for Sri Yukteswarji in what we would consider the most important text and book, maybe in in, in SRF. So a real 
beautiful way to circle around back to yeah that. definitely because because you're going to start his verse one with the, the guru disciple relationship with me and this um um this guru this yogi milarapa um is mentioned in the book through the title uh of in the preface so and obviously mm -hmm. yogananda doesn't talk about milarapa but he's allowed mm -hmm. uh dr evans wentz to be the preface writer so in a way yeah. this yogi is also in the book because this legend of milarapa is um, is very famous in this region of the world in, in north mm -hmm. india and mm -hmm. south china beautiful so much in this book that you could research and yeah you could there. go you could it's go on so and on, on yeah uh but so the next episode uh we will cover the introduction the eternal law of righteousness uh we'll talk um yeah uh, about uh everything before chapter one so tune in for this next time uh to to cover those but any before we close anything else anybody would like to talk on any of the topics today are we all good covered everything all good covered and covered great all right jai guru thank you everybody for joining us jai guru, jai guru. Jai guru. Jai guru. Jai guru.